So we've made it up to the uh, enigmatic Serpent Mound in uh, Adams County, Ohio. We're here, we've just met Jeff Wilson here. Uh, Ross Hamilton's coming by shortly. Um, it's our first real taste of it. And last night, when we were staying in Peebles with our friend Roy, amazing, powerful thunderstorm and lightning storm happened and chucked it down with rain for about an hour in the middle of the night, about 4 a.m., which woke me up and I actually went outside and it was almost like the Thunderbirds were in business and they were here saying hello. And the weather's completely changed today. It's much cooler, it's less humid, it's a bit cloudy. And, um, and we've just checked out one of the mounds which had the giant skeleton in it. So again, we're finding evidence of giants everywhere we go. Directly across on the other side of the crater, away in the distance, you see there are two sort of notches out there, the straight out. Yeah, there's like two notches. Uh, one of those is another Native American site called Fort Hill, straight across. There are two magnetic highs and two magnetic lows uh, in various parts of the crater. Um, you mentioned the impactor hitting the fault. Right. Uh, and it basically shattered the rock going down 7,000 feet or so. Um, and when it did that, it, uh, it created a gravitational anomaly. And those were also mapped back in the 1950s. So there's a couple of gravitational anomalies inside the crater as well. What do you okay. mean by gravitational anomaly? So the, the density of the rock has changed. And so the normal gravitational field that we experience changes because the density of the rock is radically transformed from that impact. Well, we know that, that uh, pretty much every single Native American culture that ever existed in the state of Ohio left something here at Serpent Mound. There are paleo artifacts, archaic artifacts, Adena artifacts, Hopewell artifacts, intrusive mound culture artifacts, and Fort Ancient artifacts. It covers the entire spectrum of eight to 10,000 years right. of occupation. Five other Serpent Mounds stretching right? across from the East Coast to probably Kansas is as far west. There may be one up uh, into uh, the Dakotas that was recorded, a couple of them up in the Dakotas. Some are made out of stone, some are made out of earth. There's actually one that's actually carved into the ground, which is one of the most, uh, one of the designs that's closest to this design, uh, is actually one that was carved into the ground. Are those, um, are those still available to see? There are, the one in Kansas is, uh, that's called an intaglio. It's carved into the ground, not a mound up. Um, there are, there's one actually in Adams County, Illinois, that was uh, recognized first in the late 1800s. And it's very, it's very much broken like the one up in uh, Ontario. Uh, interestingly enough, I've got two satellite photos that, that were taken at different times of that one. And one, when, uh, you can see the broken sections of it, and then you have the you know, split opening for the mouth of the head and the oval kind of in front. But then I got a satellite photo that was taken in the springtime uh, after the snow has melted, and the whole area around it is actually flooded. And in in the broken mounds are the only pieces that you can see as if the serpent is undulating through the water. Yeah. Um, and it may have been designed that way think about the one up in Ontario, it's on the shore of Rice Lake. It may have also been designed that way and the lake levels have come down. So it could be that they were trying to replicate that, uh, you know, great horned serpent that lived in the water. So uh, that, that, that those two sites are kind of similar, the one in Illinois and the one in Ontario. Uh, there's one stone serpent in Kentucky on the other side of the Ohio River going south from here. Uh, actually, it's up the Ohio but on the Kentucky side. That also had the sort of split head and an oval and kind of a undulating body. Uh, probably about 10 years ago, a cell phone company leased the top of the hill where it was located and they built their cell phone right into the head of the serpent and destroyed that portion of it, but the rest of it is still there. Um, I wanna know, I, I think there's one that another stone serpent that existed kind of near Fort Ancient on the other side of the river that's uh, yeah. over in Warren County. Yeah. Um, that, heard of them. Anderson that was excavated and then it was covered back over uh, to protect it from people messing with it. But it's nothing on the scope of the size of this. No. This is really the largest one. So, so uh, this, this section of the serpent here is this is the last coil coming up here and then it straightens out 
and then it splits into what's known as the head of the serpent. So it's like the neck of the serpent here. And straight down this, passing through the center point of the mouth of the serpent, splitting the oval, going in that direction, that line is where the summer solstice sunset happens. So the sun will come down right on that alignment on the 21st of June, roughly, every year. And this little area here, this is... Uh... Right, so uh, in, in Ross Hamilton's idea of the layout of Serpent Mound being like the constellation of Draco, there's one star that doesn't fit in the constellation along the body of the serpent. And that star would have fit right in the center point here. That would have been Alpha Draconis, or the North Celestial Pole, about 5,000 years ago. And this point over here where that star would have been is about is the exact midpoint of the serpent. So the distance from here to the tip of the serpent and the distance from here to the tip of the tail is uh, identical. So um, when Tor um, came over with uh, Jason to, uh, to check out the Serpent Mountain, I was back in Cincinnati, but a friend of ours was running the museum. And at the time, you could still walk on the mountain a little bit. They've since kind of changed that because there was some damage done. But what Tor did was he, he took his camera, which was a good camera, and he used it to video um, different things, and it was a reliable camera. It had a good microphone on it. And he left it in the center of the oval, and he happened to place a crystal on that, on that spot. Now, when the American Society of Dowsers were here in the 80s, they unanimously declared the center of the oval to be the meeting point of uh, six lines of force, perfectly straight, so they met at like an asterisk type of formation. And they, some of them said there were 12, and some of them said there were six shadows between the six main. And some said out of those six main, three went in and three went out. So they called them ley lines, although in the United States, of course, we don't have ley lines, and we never have. We have sites that seem to connect but they don't do it so much by towns like they do in Great Britain. We have uh, like the great magnetic line that connects seven major cities. But apart from that, it's usually ancient sites that connect and not, uh, you know, towns that end in L.A. Line. So um, when they released this information to me, I didn't know what to make of it, but I've, I extrapolated a, um, a figure out of it. Uh, joined with some of the other PowerPoints that they had found. And um, it was interesting because it turned out to be precisely the same as the Flower of Life geometry. And this is a couple of years before Drunvalo had released his first book. And so I showed it to some people at Summer Solstice Celebration, and they said that's remarkable because the serpent fit perfectly upon it. It just went cunningly around these 37 points. Now, that figure is also mentioned in the book of Revelation, or the Revelation of John, more properly. And so, um, it's an ancient figure, and when Tor came and placed his camera down, and placed the crystal there right in the middle, by happenstance where the dowsers had said, those lines all conjunct, he, he walked away from it so you could get some idea of the zone. And then, um, when he kind of developed the film, when, you know, when he put it up on YouTube, he noticed that it was making a sound, that the camera was picking up a sound when it was pointed at the crystal. So fortunately, he had pointed it away from the crystal and it didn't make the sound. He had moved the crystal a little bit and it didn't make the sound. But when he laid it down again, it picked up this god-awful sound, like a, a mechanical rapping sound. And uh, there's another fellow who I'll tell you about later who uh, had done some similar work in Georgia at a stone serpent. And the ser actual serpent was built over these power points on, on some sort of a world grid. And it had picked up energy that was generally distributed through the entire stone serpent. And he also, independently of Tor, had found this line like something like five, six years ago. And um, he sent me his video and he was wondering what that sound could be. It was the same kind of mechanical jabbering sound. 
yeah, you can see that there's a sort of circular mound right here. In all of the earlier diagrams before the uh, Putnam reconstruction in the 1880s, this was actually connected to the serpent. And there's another one on the opposite side that mirrors that. Some people call it the wings of the serpent. Some people call it the horns of the great horned serpent. It's hard to know exactly what these features indicated. But uh, these were actually connected. And once Putnam did his reconstruction, these were sort of diminished and became, instead of linear features, they came, became oval features. The, of course, the Historical Society put the asphalt pathway now in between this, so it's now separated from the serpent, but it was once connected. On the opposite side, they actually put the asphalt pathway right over the top of that mound. And uh, you'll see that uh, as we make, a, make the walk on the other side. So this is like the head? This the is the oval. The head is the oval. section, the triangular section okay, behind. Okay. Now, and, th and this is where the stone, the main megalith that we're going to go and have a look at, could have been as well. Could, could have been. Ah, well, could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, um, what I will show the Maya, you. Is... Maya say that this is the Ket of Quetzalcoatl. Ket is the symbol of the universe. It's the great oval. It's the egg of Brahma. Okay, if, if that's where the stones were, if we just went the easiest, shortest distance to the cliffside, we might be able to find some of the stones. And that's exactly what's here. You see there's one there, one there, there's one there, there's another one there. There's a whole bunch of them we actually flagged out going down the hillside on both sides. Uh, so the original stones of the stone altar are probably scattered down this hillside. Um, we actually did a project a couple of years ago where we took an industrial leaf blower and blew away all the leaves uh, and found that only within like a 12 foot area going down the hill were stones. There was no stones anywhere else. So we think that those were the stones that came out of the center of the altar. So that would have been potentially a prehistoric can altar at the yes. center? Mm -hmm. Okay. You're looking straight through the center of the oval right down the back of the serpent. Okay. Now we heard a kind of a local legend a number of years ago um, that came from the first whites that encountered the Indians down in the valley below, that the, the shaman of that village, whenever anybody, any Native American died in their village or in surrounding villages, they would take these uh, stone eggs and they would collect the souls of the dead people into these eggs. And then every year on the day of the summer solstice, they would come to places like Serpent Mound and they would put them on the stone altar. And there was this legend that there used to be a post that stood out, a wooden post that stood out in the tip of the serpent. And that on the day of the summer solstice, as the sun came down, the shadow of the post would get longer and longer until the moment the sun touched the horizon, that was the longest of the shadow of the post, and it would touch the stone, the shadow would touch the stone altar and the souls of those dead people would be released to the next world. Now we thought that was a really cool story. Would there be any evidence to find out whether or not that was true? And a couple of years ago, this little hole started to develop right here. Don't use up all my water. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Do you have another one? Yeah. Is that on the alignment? <laughs> kind of. It's, it's right on the alignment. It is exactly on the summer solstice sunset alignment. So if you were able to, and we actually tested this a few years ago, if you've got a post about six feet, six and a half feet tall, on the day of the summer solstice, that shadow would pass right to the center and touch that stone altar. So a few years ago, I found a three-dimensional model that was constructed of Serpent Man that was built around 1900. And in their model, they have a post on the model that stood at the head of the serpent. So it could be that a long time ago, people knew that that post was there, but now it's sort of been forgotten history. So we're um, at the head of uh, the Serpent Mound, right down in the, the valley below it. And uh, here is where a megalith has been discovered. And I'm here with Jeffrey Wilson and Ross Hamilton is on his way. Um, and it seems like this may have been part of the Serpent Mound itself. Um, so let's go and take a look at it. I mean, it's difficult to see there, but it's just behind that sign on the right. And that is quite a, quite a, 
looks like a worked block. Quite rare for these parts. Yeah, you can see uh, it's about 11 feet long, very rectangular up both sides. It's also the same depth all the way around. But you can see right down here where it's been shaped to a point. Um, this is the area that I think is tuned. So, you know, if you pick up a rock and you tap it down here, uh, if you put your ear up at the other end, it sounds as if the stone is hollow. Uh, it, so it's, it's got a bit of tuning to it. The end bit looks a bit like um, a classic Manitou stone. Could be, yeah. Uh, which you get in New England. Right. Now Ross thinks, Ross's idea is that this stone somehow was toppled over from up above. That one time it sat up in the center of the serpent and somehow and it wound up down here. I'm not sure I agree with that. I think that maybe they brought it up the creek and they were going to bring it up here. And once they got to this point, they said, we got to carry it up there. And maybe they didn't get that far. And maybe this is just kind of where it ended up. It's hard to know. It, it looks toppled. It does. <laughs> it looks like it's, it was doing something up there. Right. That is something else, isn't it? What do you think of the shape of the head of it? That bit looks like a Manitou stone. Mm -hmm. Like a classic New England stone. Yeah. You find all over the place. Um, you know, I've seen that in a lot, a lot of different... That's exactly why I wanted to ask you that. I know you've seen a lot of stone. It's like a lot of people are still coming in and visiting. So yeah. also that bit there, I mean, if you're going to put it upright, it's useful to have something sharp to get it in the ground with. Yeah. Um, that's just a practical thing. Um, now, uh, now, if you move your camera over here, you can see... It's so easy to round. It's a lot easier. This side is easy. very straight. Yeah, that is very clean, isn't it? It's very clean. And the top looks like it's been... And there are some hash marks. There. We had the moss cleared off up to that point, and I'll go back so you can't see the hash marks anymore. But if you if you are adventurous, you have mountain goat legs. <laughs> if you get up to the top, you'll see that it's cut into a square. Okay, let's take a look. Yeah, if you want to hold it's that, a challenge to get up there. Yeah. He's recording. Okay. Now, now, stick your ear up to it. Now, just tap it. You can put your ear right on the stone. You just yep. barely tap it. Okay. Oh yeah, that's vibrating all the way through, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Even just a tiny little tap, you can hear. Let me let me tap it in a tiny way. Yes, it's right on the other end. Mm -hmm. It's almost like it's down there. Yeah. That is the so there. that's why I say I think the stone's been tuned. Yeah. <laughs> it's nicely crystalline. And it's not this type of rock then at all. It's completely different. Yeah. It, so, it seems so like the closest different. area this could have come from. We don't know. Don't know. Uh, this, this kind of dolomite can be converted into cement by heating it up and, you know, pulverizing it and so forth. But uh, there, as the sun moves, it, it seems almost obvious that someone has attempted to repair this at one time. Yeah. This is a lot easier to see in the winter time when all the leaves are down off the trees. I've got a nice panoramic shot taken from back there a ways that you can see this all the way down to the cave past. Uh, there's a cave up the hill here. Uh, we can walk up that way and look at it if you want. So, the, uh, where I mentioned the Andrew, Andrew Carmichael, is that he thinks that it's uh, a, a, a simulacrum of some sort, and I agree with him. I've always thought that if there was an entryway into the underworld of the serpent, which is very much an Indian lore, that it may be beneath the stone serpent's head, and that it was intentionally covered over and sealed a long time ago because it's one of the sacred repositories. Now, all cultures agree that the serpent has been in some way vitally sacred to them, and this is the, perhaps the only remaining serpent effigy in the United States, or in fact in the world, even including the Scottish serpent, um, that seems to have uh, been intentionally preserved, as though the hand of fate were some way uh, involved in it. And according to Blavatsky and uh, other esotericists from uh, going back many years, uh, sites uh, that had 
these seals on them, the sphinx-like seal, the silent serpent, and then the mark on the top were definitely, um, what should we call them, sepulcher? But a repository is a good name. We would call them in flat English tombs, tombs for the ancient lost knowledge of prehistory. And that when the gods walked the earth, when we were of a higher mentality, in other words, they somehow anticipated our falling down into a darker period when we would forget all these things. And so they took time and consolidated all of their knowledge into a few sites around the world. And it's from these sites that we'll begin to reconstruct what we have to do to restore the paradise. And Thank you.